Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 13th June 2019. The list of articles which has been chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi and Thirunandapuram editions are provided here. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the timestamping is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to our first article analysis. This article is an editorial which is with respect to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The article discussion will be helpful in prelims under the area current events of national and international importance. The discussion will also be helpful in main syllabus in general studies paper 2 under the area functions and responsibilities of the union, structure and functioning of state legislatures. The discussion could be linked to GS paper 3 in the area linkages between development and spread of extremism and role of external state and non-state actors in creating challenges to internal security also. In this editorial, the author asks to hold the state assembly elections as soon as possible in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The author finds two statements which was made by the Prime Minister of the country contradicting with the non-conducting of timely state assembly elections of Jammu and Kashmir. One is when the uh, Prime Minister stated in April 2019 that the problem of terrorism in the state of Jammu and Kashmir was contained from about 9 to 10 districts to about 2.5 districts. Now know that there are 22 districts in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The second statement made by the Prime Minister is during the conduct of local body elections for panchayats in the state of Jammu and Kashmir in December 2018. There were zero violence in election and he added that this panchayat election has also indicated that the people of Jammu and Kashmir are enthusiastic for democratic process. Then the author's point is that when Prime Minister has made such statements, why the state assembly elections were not conducted for almost 12 months. Lastly, state assembly elections were conducted in JNK in the year 2014. The full term of the government would have ended by November or December 2019. But in June 2018, BJP withdrew its support for the coalition from the state government in Jammu and Kashmir. So now it has been almost a year since the resignation of leadership of the state government. So, the state government of JNK is under governor's rule now. Therefore, the author says that the prime minister and his advisors are suffering from a syndrome called as Alice in Wonderland syndrome. If a person is affected by this syndrome, it means that the perceptions of the person who is affected by the syndrome are wrong. The person will see a straight line and say that it is a wavy line. The author uses this syndrome to suggest that the PM and his advisors do not say what is in reality. Also that they are significantly distorted or diverted from the reality of what actually happens in Jammu and Kashmir. A recent development in the state heavily affected the local masses. That is one and a half months after the Pulwama terrorist attack, the government passed an order that banned civilian traffic movement for two days a week in the national highway between Baramulla and Udhampur district of Jammu and Kashmir. This was done to facilitate the orderly conduct of the Lok Sabha elections in Jammu and Kashmir and for the movement of security troops. There were remarks from the people of Kashmir that such extreme steps were not even taken during the Kargil conflict of 1999. We have discussed uh, this issue in our analysis in 23rd April 2019 video. The link has been provided in the description box. Please have a look at it. This banning of civilian traffic affected over 69 lakh of local people because this highway is the lifeline of the local population. It is called as lifeline because the people will get their basic amenities and fast moving consumer goods by using this highway only. The highway has several lateral roads and passes through more than two and a half districts. It was found that sometimes the armed forces exclusively used the roads even more than the stipulated two days. So the ban was lifted 
in the last week of May. The author says that the ban was lifted because it was untenable. That is, the government felt it is difficult and unsustainable to maintain the ban as there was a criticism among the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Then the author shares how the panchayat elections took place in November-December period of 2018. He says that the mainstream political parties did not even participate in the elections. Election authorities say that the voter turnout in panchayat elections is around 74%. But if you see, in Jammu division, it was 83.5%. In Ladakh, it was 67.8%. But in Kashmir division and Kashmir valley, the voter turnout was just above 40% in the panchayat elections, which was held in nine phases. Particularly in phase six, in the Kashmir division, the voter turnout was just 17.3%. Also, in many wards, according to the author, lower voter turnout was seen and there were no representatives in hundreds of wards also. Even in the Lok Sabha elections, there were less interest or less enthusiasm from the people of Baramulla, Srinagar and Anantanag. And also, no interest or enthusiasm was found among the local population of Shopian and Pulwama areas also. The author highlights that the lack of enthusiasm is not because of pressure from separatists. There is no enthusiasm simply because people do not want to vote or does not want to be a part of democratic processes. This is because the people of Jammu and Kashmir feel rejected and alienated to be a part of democratic processes of our nation. The Prime Minister is saying Insaniyat Jamhuriyat Kashmiriyat. These words were coined by the then Prime Minister of India, Sri Atal Bihari Vajpayee, on the doctrine of Kashmir. Here, Insaniyat means humanity, Jamhuriyat means peace of the people through democracy, and Kashmiriyat means the secular and friendly cultural values of the people of Kashmir. In such a case, integration should happen, but what is happening is alienation. The author says there should not be any delay in holding the state assembly elections. For delaying elections till November, small reasons are being told such as tourism season and Amarnath Yatra etc. But these reasons are nothing before the greater role of democracy. The article states that in November, Jammu becomes the capital of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Know that Jammu is the winter capital of the state and uh, Srinagar is the summer capital of the state. Uh, for remembering this, you can just uh, use a small trick like uh, there is S in Srinagar and summer. So, Srinagar is the summer capital of state. Also, governor's rule should not continue in Jammu and Kashmir. This is because during the seven year period of governor's rule in 1990s, militancy and separatism has increased. So, to save Jammu and Kashmir, governor's rule should be ended by holding assembly elections. If the election was further delayed, this will lead to taking up of militancy by many young and educated people who already feel alienated. The author concludes the article by saying that the Prime Minister should bring a sense of inclusiveness in the Kashmir Valley. So, for people to feel they are included in a democracy, the first and foremost thing is to conduct the elections. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. Moving on to the next news article, which is also an editorial. It is about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. The discussion will be relevant in main syllabus under GS Paper 2 in the area India and its neighborhood relations, then in bilateral and global groupings and agreements involving India and or affecting India's interests, then also in effect of policies and politics of developed countries on India's interests. In this editorial, the author discusses about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, then what to expect from the summit and what will be India's stand. The 19th Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit will be held in Bishkek, which is the capital of Kyrgyzstan Republic. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization that is SCO is a permanent intergovernmental international organization. It strengthens the mutual trust and neighborliness among its member states. 
It also promotes the effective cooperation of its member states in politics, trade, economy, research, technology and culture etc. Currently the SCO comprises of 8 member states namely India, Kazakhstan, China, Kyrgyz Republic, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Very recently on 11th June we had a very detailed discussion about SCO. The link for that video is given in the description box. Please go and have a look at it. It was said that the issues related to terrorism, Afghanistan, regional security, multilateral dialogue and global scenario will be a part of the discussion at the summit. The author states that the summit is also likely to have a muted agenda that is it will have a low key agenda also. This is because SEO's secretary general has indirectly implied about adopting agreements regarding the deepening of multilateral cooperation among member countries and also implied about discussing non-conventional issues such as uh, the fight against drug trafficking, cooperation in the field of IT, environmental protection and healthcare. The author mentions about the important meetings of Indian Prime Minister with the presidents of China and Russia and what can be expected from these meetings. Firstly, the meeting with the Chinese president is important especially because our Prime Minister is now being guided by his new external affairs minister and also this meeting comes after China's decision to withdraw its technical hold on listing the Jaish-e Mohammed chief Masood Azhar as a global terrorist at the United Nations Security Council. Then meeting with the Russian President Vladimir Putin is also important. This is because India wants to save the S-400 contact deal with Russia. This save is against the threat of USA to impose sanctions on India under USA's Kartsa Act. US has warned India to not to go on with the deal. Otherwise, sanctions will be imposed on India. Then it is expected that the Russian president might invite our Prime Minister to be the chief guest at the Eastern Economic Forum of Russia which will be held in September. The Eastern Economic Forum was established by a decree of the President of the Russian Federation Vladimir Putin in 2015. The objectives of the forum include strengthening ties between the international investment community, Russian businesses and federal, regional and local government bodies of Russia. Then conducting a comprehensive expert assessment of the economic potential of the Russian Far East and improving the region's competitiveness and attractiveness to investors both nationally and internationally. So the author says this would be a good opportunity for India to explore Russia's Far East region. This is not just for developing economic cooperation but also for exploring the prospects of transferring skilled laborers. This is especially to balance the Chinese demographic threats in the Russia's Far East region. Next the author lists what are the concerns of India on the summit. Firstly the author says that India will have to navigate between two contradictory factors. It means factors that are opposed to each other. One is India has to act as a willing partner of the regional cooperation which will be led by uh, China and Russia during the summit. Then the other is it must uh, avoid being seen as a part of anti-American gang. This indicates that because of the regional cooperation India has to maintain the same regional cooperation with Pakistan also as Pakistan is a member state of SCO. Then already there is a trade war going on between China and USA and along with the age old cold war between Russia and USA. So the actions of India in this summit are very crucial so that the world especially USA does not perceive that India is a part of the anti-American gang. Then another concern is in the summit Russia and the Central Asian countries are likely to express broad support for China in its escalating tariff fight between US and China. Tariff means tax or duty to be paid on a particular class of imports or exports. Actually what happened is 
US put tariffs on Chinese imports and then as a response China imposed retaliatory tariffs on American goods. This has already led to the cut of bilateral trade between China and USA. Now India is equally concerned about this trade war because India is unclear whether it will join the other member countries in, in the broad support for China or not because the broad support would mean a severely criticizing the US protectionism. So this may lead to increase in distance between India US bilateral relationship also. Remember whenever we use the word protectionism it means the practice of shielding a country's domestic industries from foreign competition by taxing imports which USA is doing with China. The author says that India is willing to fight against terrorism with the cooperation of SCO member states is a paradox that is it is absurd. This is because SCO also includes countries like Pakistan that pose the biggest threats to Indian security. Then another concern is that except India all SCO members are enthusiastic supporters of the Belt and Road Initiative of China. The Belt and Road Initiative or BRI is an ambitious effort of China to improve regional cooperation and connectivity on a transcontinental scale. The initiative aims to strengthen infrastructure, trade and investment links between China and some 65 other countries. However, there are certain disagreements between India and China on BRI because of lack of transparency, debt burdens etc. In addition to this, India is also objecting the China-Pakistan economic corridor due to sovereignty concerns. This is because the China-Pakistan economic corridor passes through Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Then next concern is that the tourism discussion is likely to be approached from the angle of improving the situation in Afghanistan. The author says the discussion may not necessarily include curbing the terrorist elements emerging from Pakistan. Now, what does India stand in the SCO? The author says that India seems to be committed to work within the SCO so as to first develop a cooperative and sustainable security framework, then to make the regional anti-terrorist structure that is RATS more effective and also to participate in the efforts of SCO to bring stability in Afghanistan. Then the author says that the member countries support India's proposal for a comprehensive convention on international terrorism. It was proposed by India in 1996 but the ratification of this convention is in an unfinished state due to the opposition from the US and the organization of Islamic cooperation countries that is the OIC countries. The significance of this convention was to ensure a state support to prosecute or extradite those who have committed acts of terrorism in a third country. Then the author says that the topic of India's resolution to fight terrorism will be brought up by our Prime Minister. This will be done by drawing the SCO's attention to the terrorist attacks in Pulwama and Sri Lanka. But China would not like this idea of India because it may dislike the use of SCO to shame Pakistan for the attack. Then the author says India may stick to its position on the Belt and Road Initiative as we mentioned above and there is a possibility in progress on the international north-south transport corridor, the Chabahar port, the Ashgabat agreement and the India Myanmar Thailand trilateral highway also. These are of high importance to India on the economic front. We will discuss these in detail in the coming days. Then the meeting of Indian Prime Minister and his Pakistan counterpart may happen in the summit. And the author says if it happens India might chart a new policy course in favor of making the ties normal with Pakistan. As a conclusion the author notes that so far the institutional level measures of SCO including the joint SCO military exercises have not given any satisfactory results. This is in view of jointly fighting against terrorism. But the author concludes that the SCO is relevant for India because this will help India to get support for demanding the reform of United Nations Security Council. The reform is the expansion of permanent and non-permanent membership at UNSC. India along with a majority of UN members 
support this expansion so as to make the UNSC more representative and effective. Also, India has been lending support to the SCO member countries for non-permanent membership of the UNSC for a long time. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. Moving on to the next news article which is about the acute encephalitis syndrome. The analysis of this news article will be helpful in your prelims preparation under current events of national and international importance and also under general science. The analysis will also be relevant in your mains preparation in GS paper 2 under issues relating to development and management of social sector relating to health. Acute encephalitis syndrome is a serious public health problem in India. Acute encephalitis syndrome or AES is commonly called as brain fever in India. The terms encephalitis uh, means inflammation of the brain. Let us see the symptoms of this syndrome now. The individual affected by this syndrome will first have fever. Then there will be a change in the mental status of that affected person. Like the individual may have a mental confusion, disorientation, delirium or coma. Here know that delirium is an abrupt change in the brain that causes mental confusion and emotional disruption. It makes it difficult to think, remember, sleep, pay attention, etc. Then the person affected by encephalitis may also suffer from seizures. The syndrome most commonly affects children and young adults and this syndrome can also lead to considerable morbidity and mortality. Here morbidity means the condition of being diseased meaning the individual will suffer from the disease then uh, mortality means leading to death. AES mostly occurs due to viruses. But in recent years, other sources such as bacteria, fungus, parasites, chemicals, toxins and non-infectious agents have also been reported to cause acute encephalitis syndrome. Out of the viruses, Japanese encephalitis virus is the major cause of AES in India. If you see, at least 5% to 35% AES cases are caused by Japanese encephalitis virus. Japanese encephalitis is a mosquito-borne zoonotic viral disease. Zoonotic means passing from animals to humans. If you see, Japanese encephalitis virus can be seen in animals and birds also. There is no antiviral treatment for patients with Jap encephalitis. The treatment is generally to relieve the symptoms. Know that there are vaccines available to prevent Japanese encephalitis. Next, Streptococcus pneumonia, which is a bacteria, also causes acute encephalitis syndrome in India. If you see, even Nipah virus and Zika virus are also found to cause AES. However, the causes for a large number of cases still remain unidentified. So, it is really tough for the health administration to find the reason for acute encephalitis syndrome if it spreads in a new area. And the uh, treatment for the syndrome also depends on the type of a causative agent. During 2018, at least 10,000 cases of uh, AES and uh, 632 deaths were reported from 17 states in India. So, we can see that the fatality rate is around 6%. The cases were reported mainly from the states like Assam, Bihar, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. Although the AES cases other than uh, Japanese encephalitis continue to be reported throughout the year, there is an overall increase of total AES cases in the month of June. It peaks during the months of July and August and declines in September-October months. So we can see in today's news that there are many deaths reported in the states of Bihar due to AES. Before seeing the news, know that India also has a nationwide program to address this acute encephalitis syndrome. It is called as the National Program for Prevention and Control of Japanese Encephalitis or Acute Encephalitis Syndrome. In short, it is called as NPPCJA. A multi-pronged strategy has been adopted under this national program in 60 high priority districts in 5 states. Uh, namely Assam, Bihar, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. This program will be implemented with the participation of six central ministries which are 
Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation, Ministry of Housing, Urban Poverty Alleviation, Ministry of uh, Social Justice and Empowerment, Ministry of Women and Child Development, and finally, the Ministry of Human Resource Development, especially the Department of School Education and R Literacy. Now, these measures mentioned here are parts of the National Program for Prevention and Control of JE or AES. First, first measure is the strengthening and expansion of Japanese encephalitis vaccination in affected districts. Next is, it will focus on the strengthening of surveillance and vector control. Vectors are those living organisms which transmits disease pathogens. Next is the focus will be on strengthening of case management like having a proper hospital infrastructure. Next is uh, uh, focus will be on providing access to safe drinking water and proper sanitation facilities to the target population in affected rural and urban areas. Then next is uh, the provision of adequate facilities for physical, medical, neurological and social rehabilitation. Then finally, the program will focus on the improvement of uh, nutritional status of children at risk of uh, Japanese encephalitis or AES. Now let us see the news article. The news article mentions that central teams have arrived in Bihar to fight the increase in encephalitis cases in Bihar. The news mentions that there were at least 11 deaths between January and June 8 of this year in Bihar due to AES, but 48 cases were reported. So, the center has deployed a multi-specialty team to understand the situation in the state. The central team will review the increase in cases of encephalopathy and encephalitis and assist Bihar in containing or controlling the disease. This team is in addition to a central team that is already in Muzaffarpur district of Bihar. The team will also visit various hospitals to assess the situation and support the state government. Here know that encephalopathy is a broad term for any brain disease that alters brain function or structure. The news also states that Bihar has registered a rise in cases of AES in Muzaffarpur district and Japanese encephalitis in Gaya district. There is one more news box within this news article which mentions that Muzaffarpur district has admitted 22 cases who are suffering from fever, hypoglycemia and unconsciousness. Here know that hypoglycemia causes abnormally low levels of sugar in the blood or a deficiency of sodium or potassium in the body. With this we have come to the end of this article discussion. The displayed prelims question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article which is about the retail inflation and growth in the industrial sector. The discussion will be relevant in prelims preparation under the area current events of national importance and also in economic development. The discussion can also be linked to main syllabus under GS paper 3 in the area Indian economy. The article states that retail inflation in the month of May 2019 has moved marginally or slightly increased to 3.05 percent. This has happened mainly due to the rise in food prices, especially the rise in the price of vegetables. This 3.05 percent high is seen after 7 months. It was 2.99 percent in the month of April 2019. Now, what is this retail inflation? In simple words, the inflation that is uh, the increase in price which is experienced at retail shops. This gives the actual reflection of the price rise in the country. In India, the inflation rate at retail level is given by the consumer price index that is CPI. CPI is used to measure the changes over time in general level of retail prices of selected goods and services. These goods and services are those which the households purchase for the purpose of consumption. So, these changes affect the real purchasing power of consumers income and their welfare. The CPI measures price changes in a period of time by comparing the cost of a fixed basket of commodities. Whenever we say basket in economics, it refers to a fixed set of consumer products and services which is valued on an annual basis. 
the basket is based on the expenditures of a target population in a certain reference period the basket contains commodities of unchanging or equivalent quantity and quality so the index reflects pure price only over the years cpis have been widely used as a macroeconomic indicator of inflation or headline inflation it is also used as a tool by government and central government that is rbi for targeting inflation and monitoring the price stability then cpi is also used as deflator in the national accounts a deflator is used to convert the data compiled over a period into the prices that prevail at an earlier point in time this means a deflator removes the effect of inflation from data making it uh, comparable across periods for example it is used as a gdp price deflator it measures the difference between real gdp and nominal gdp so it signifies whether the gross domestic product has happened on account of higher prices or because of increase in output therefore cpi is considered as one of the most important economic indicators also know that cpi is released by central statistics office which works under the ministry of statistics and program implementation the overall combined cpi is given by computing cpi rural cpi urban and C cfpi which means consumer food price index cfpi accounts to more than 50% of weight finally these are the six components of cpi they include food and beverages pan tobacco and intoxicants clothing and footwear housing fuel and light and lastly miscellaneous miscellaneous include health education transport recreation etc out of all food and beverage has the highest weightage in the month of may the inflation in the food and beverages segment accelerated to 2.03% from 1.38% over the same period however the fuel and light segment saw inflation of 2.48% in may from 2.56% in the previous month pan tobacco and other intoxicants and the clothing and footwear segments saw slight inflation in may then the article also talks about the rise in the industrial growth front for the month of april 2019 this is because the factory output is rising by 3.4% the 3.4% is a 6 month high this growth was mainly driven by the electricity and mining sectors the mining sector saw accelerating growth to 5.1% from 0.8% over the same period also the manufacturing sector is growing by 2.8% so the growth in the index of industrial production has returned to a positive territory in april because it was declining at 0.1% in march the recovery in the iap is mostly due to the fact that the government might have been able to spend more this spending might have happened through the approvals of the interim budget as the new financial year started experts say in the first few months of the new financial year there will be more government expenditure and so this growth can continue for about 3 months so what is this index of industrial production the all india index of industrial production is a composite indicator that measures the short term changes in the volume of production of a basket of industrial products this is calculated during a given period with respect to that in a chosen base period the base period for iap has been changed from 2004 5 to 2011 to 12 it is compiled and published monthly by the central statistics office that is cso cso is under the ministry of statistics and program implementation this compilation is given with a time lag of 6 weeks from the reference month it is calculated based on the performance of three sectors which are manufacturing mining and electricity here manufacturing has the highest weightage it takes into account the following types of goods into account from the above sectors they include basic goods capital goods intermediate goods consumer durable and non durable goods the following are the eight core industries of iap 
they are considered as core because they impact every economic activity and serve as a backbone of all other industries. The eight core industries constitute 40.27 percent of the total index of industrial production. Finally, let us see the significance of IAP. The All India IAP provides a single representative figure to me measure the general level of industrial activity in the economy. This is on a monthly basis. It is free of any influences like price changes. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. The displayed prelims question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article, which is about early childhood education proposal under the right to education framework. This article discussion will be relevant in prelim syllabus under the area current events of national importance, then in public policy under Indian polity and governance. The article discussion will be helpful in mains in general studies paper 2 under the area government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and also in issues relating to development and management of social sector or services related to education. Whenever you hear about early childhood education or early childhood care, immediately article 45 of Indian constitution should come to your mind. This is because this article deals with the early childhood education. It states that the state shall endeavor to provide early childhood care and education for all children until they complete the age of 6 years. This is not a fundamental right, but it is a part of directive principles of state policy. Now, let us discuss the article. The draft national education policy pro proposes that the provisions of the Right to Education Act of 2009 be extended to the children in the age group of 3 years up to 6 years. Till now, the Right to Education Act applies to all children in the age category of about 6 years of age. That is why Article 21A states that the state shall provide free and compulsory education to all children of the age of 6 to 14 years. This obviously means from class 1 to class 8. The author states that the proposal is to put the children of 3 year up to 6 years of age in a stimulating nursery environment. The author comments that this proposal is a wholly or totally positive move and also a welcome logical measure. The classes taken before the completion of 6 years of age and before the class 1 are called as preschool classes. According to pedagogical view that is according to teaching standards preschool is important for two reasons one this preschool phase is crucial for stimulating a child's curiosity curiosity is the desire to know things without curiosity one cannot learn properly with deep understanding and the second reason is that this preschool will help to prepare a child for schooling at age six here schooling starts from learning at class one the draft national education policy also proposes to infuse learning component with the basic nutrition oriented child development programs. Some of the nutrition oriented child development programs are National Nutrition Mission, Integrated Child Development Services Scheme and Integrated Child Protection Scheme. Now these are the nutrition oriented schemes. The draft national education policy wants to make these programs complete by adding the learning component also. The author feels that the preschool learning component in right to education will be a big step forward. But if such measure is not made equitably accessible, then the RTE law will not make any remarkable and transformative changes. The author feels that India's Right to Education Act is a far-sighted legislation that provides for 25% of seats in classes of 1 to 8 in schools, free and compulsory for children belonging to the weaker and disadvantaged group. But the legislation is making slow progress in mainstreaming equity in many states because of absence of strong political commitment. This is because only if strong political commitment is there those who violate the RTE law can be penalized. Strong political commitment is required to punish those who run schools for making profit and not making education accessible to all children. According to the author, 87.3% of the schools 
do not comply with the requirements of the right of children to free and compulsory education act of 2009 in such a scenario the achievement of full coverage of children under the act will take many decades decade is a 10 year period one decade means 10 years two decade means 20 years so in such a scenario it will take many years to achieve the coverage of all children then the author states that there are certain pre requirements that have to be taken only then giving education to all children of age 3 and above can become a reality firstly more financial resources should be allocated and timely disposal of reimbursements by the state governments is necessary central government which has concurrent responsibility also has to give more timely financial resources to all the states and union territories right now we are spending only around 2.5% of the gdp for education the author suggests spending up to 6% to transform the education sector there shall be addition of special section that is an early childhood section in ministry of women and child development to monitor and implement the early childhood care and education the anganwadi centers that are now available for early childhood care should be reformed and given necessary advancements in infrastructure and others this will help the learning component of small children with nutrition oriented programs the central government should play a leadership role in persuading states that are implementing rte act poorly to take up urgent reforms then mission mode implementation or fast plan based implementation of completion of well designed school complexes should be set up this is more important for government schools as they lag behind infrastructure quality compared to private schools the state governments should fill the vacancies of teachers in a timely manner and the recruited teachers has to be trained based on scientific and child oriented teaching methods the author states that these education reforms are very important to prepare children with cutting edge skills which will be necessary for continued economic progress then changes should be carried out in the rte act to prepare all children for a more productive schooling phase when all children get more productive schooling phase india's educational system will become morally fair and more egalitarian egalitarian means all people are equal and all people deserve equal rights and equal opportunities don't confuse egalitarianism with utilitarianism utilitarianism means greatest amount of good for the greatest number with this we have come to the end of uh, this article discussion the displayed practice prelims question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session if you look at the first question it is about the acute encephalitis syndrome the question says which of the following statements is wrong about acute encephalitis syndrome which is often seen in news here if you see the first statement is correct because japanese encephalitis virus is the major cause of acute encephalitis syndrome in india and if you see at least 5% to 35% acute encephalitis syndrome cases are caused by japanese encephalitis virus so this statement is correct now if you see the second statement it is also correct because acute encephalitis syndrome is also caused by bacteria parasites chemicals and toxins now you may get confused by seeing the first statement thinking that only virus causes is acute encephalitis syndrome but if you had carefully listened to our discussion we saw that other sources such as bacteria fungus parasites chemicals toxins and non infectious agents have also been reported to cause acute encephalitis syndrome so statement b is also correct now if you see this third statement it tells that there are no fatalities reported generally due to acute encephalitis syndrome but if you see today's news article it is about the fatalities in the state of bihar and we also saw during our discussion that the fatality rate uh, recorded in 2018 due to acute encephalitis syndrome is around 6% so this statement is wrong here the question asks us to find the wrong statement about aes so here the statement c is the wrong statement so the correct answer to this question is statement c 
but also know that India has a nationwide program for prevention of and control of acute encephalitis syndrome and the name of the program is National Program for Prevention and Control of Japanese Encephalitis or Acute Encephalitis Syndrome in short NPCJA. Now if you look at the second question it says which among the following index or indices are released by the central statistics office. It has given five indices in which uh, the first one is consumer price index urban then index of uh, industrial production then CPI for agricultural laborers then wholesale price index then the CPI for industrial workers. Today in our discussion we talked about uh, CPI index of industrial production. We know that CPI and index of industrial production is given by central statistics office. So the answer should contain option 2. But if you see the given uh, codes, every option contains option 2, which means 2 is correct. Then here in this question, there are three types of CPI given. The first uh, one is uh, urban, then agricultural laborers, then for industrial workers. Today during a discussion, we discussed that the consumer price index is given by the compilation of CPI urban, CPI rural and CPI combined and which is given by central statistics office. So which means option 1 is also correct. So the answer should contain option 1 also. But here three options contain option 1. So you cannot solve this question by the use of elimination method. So for this you need to know some basic concepts like uh, CPA for agricultural laborers and industrial workers are compiled and released by the labor bureau in the ministry of labor. And uh, wholesale price index is released by the Office of Economic Advisor in the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So which means uh, 3, 4 and 5 are not released by Central Statistics Office. So the correct answer to this question is option 1 and 2 which is in option A. So the correct answer is option A. Now here this next question is based on article 21A. If you look at the first statement the first statement states that article 21a of Indian constitution deals with free and compulsory education to all children of the age of 3 to 6 years. We know that article 21a of Indian constitution deals with free and compulsory education. We normally know that. But what is the age group? Is it uh, from 3 to 6 years? No. At present article 21a deals only with the state providing free and compulsory education to all children of the age group of 6 to 14 years. This 3 to 6 years is proposed by the draft national education policy which, ha which is still a draft not yet implemented. So the first statement here is wrong. Now if you look at the second statement it states article 21a is enshrined in the constitution since 1950. Note that whenever you see a section in an act or an article in the constitution with a capital letter, this means a section or article is inserted after coming into force of the act or the constitution. That is it has been inserted by an amendment. So here the A in 21A is a capital letter which means it has been inserted by an amendment which makes statement 2 also the wrong statement. Know that article 21A has not been present in the constitution since 1950. It was inserted by the 86th Constitutional Amendment Act of 2002. As uh, both the statements are wrong, here the uh, correct answer to this question is neither 1 nor 2. Let us see one main question based on GS paper 2. Comment on the proposal by the draft national education policy of 2019 with respect to the extension of right to education to early childhood education. Now here note that this is a specific question with respect to early childhood education. So first you state the proposal to extend the RTA benefits to all children of uh, age 3 up to 6 years to get free and compulsory education uh, that is free preschool education. Then you can say that this is a welcome logical measure, a big step, a wholly positive move like how it may help in generating curiosity and preparing uh, children for schooling at or after the age of 6. You can also add that uh, for achieving the objectives of full coverage, more financial resources, strong political commitments are required. 
you can also add your own viewpoints based on today's analysis with this we have come to the end of today's uh, newspaper discussion if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar is academy youtube channel for more updates on civil service examination preparation